Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to panel session two. Um, role of civil society and media in promoting access to information and transparency. Um, it's my pleasure to invite Futura Kusari, Senior Legal Advisor, European Center for Press and Media Freedom, to moderate this session. We're still missing a panelist. He is around. He's going to join us soon. Flutra, floor is all yours. Test? Is this working? Yes, okay. Um, dear participants of the 15th ed edition of the International Conference of Information Commissioners, welcome to the second panel of the conference titled Role of Civil Society and Media in Promoting Access to Information and Transparency. Firstly, I would like to thank Commissioner Besnik Dervishi for having me here and I look forward to this panel conversation. My name is Flutura Kusari, I'm a media lawyer by profession, and I work as a senior legal advisor for the European Center for Press and Media Freedom. ECPMF is based in Leipzig, Germany, and I run a legal support program which provides support to journalists facing legal actions such as defamation lawsuits, arrest, detention, control and seizure of journalist equipment, privacy violation claims, etc. Some of the cases we support include journalists who needed to use administrative and judicial routes to force public authorities to release public documents. It is my pleasure to be here because access to information is a topic very close to my heart. Not only were my doctoral studies focused on the European Court of Human Rights standards on access to information, and I want to mention that it was a pleasure to hear the contribution of the much respected European Court of Human Rights judge, Darian Pavli. But as a human rights activist, I have filed thousands of freedom of information requests in Kosovo, not in one month, over a decade, a period of decade, and that uh, to test the um, implementation of the law on access to information, as well as to receive information which otherwise should have been public. Additionally, I was part of a legal team that sued and won a case against a former Prime Minister of Kosovo, a case that lasted a decade. Since then, every single invoice from international travel of government ministers is considered a public document. So I know from first-hand experience how important it is for media, civil society and activists to access public uh, information. Media, journalists and activists are faced with various challenges to access information and much will be said today and tomorrow about challenges. But I want to mention a particular legal threat that, face, that uh, they are facing, which is the strategic lawsuits against public participation known as SLAPs. SLAPs are unfounded legal actions used to intimidate public watchdogs and to censor information which otherwise should be in the public domain. These legal actions are an abuse of law and procedures and are used to drag public watchdogs into administrative procedures and judicial procedures to cause them costs and to keep them away from the public participation. Now, with regard to commissioners and agencies on information and privacy, SLAPs manifest themselves in two ways. One is when public watchdogs are targeted with claims based on data protection and such claims are filed before commissioners. And B, when public authorities and sometimes agencies and commissioners themselves engage in intentional procedural maneuvers which results in access to public documents being either delayed or completely denied. Personally, in the last five years, I've been involved in co-founding coalition against slaps in Europe, known as CASE, and working with the European Commission and the Council of Europe in designing legislation and measures to counter strategic lawsuits against public participation. I'm glad we finally have an EU law against slaps and the Council of Europe recommendation against slaps. Year 2024 is when the continent of Europe, for the first time, has its set of standards against slaps. And now we need to, trans, to transpose and implement this legislation. There is much work for information and data protection commissioners and agencies to do in this regard, and I'll return to this point in my concluding remarks. Now I will turn to panelists to understand more about the role of civil society and media in promoting access to information and transparency. I'm particularly interested to understand concrete collaborations between your institutions and civil society and media. 
I'm joined today, and I'll mention all the names of um, a panelists, and I'll invite them one by one, by Anjali Baradwai, um, Executive Director, Founder of Satar Nagrik Sangatan, uh, India, Blanca Lilia Ibarra Cadena, Commissioner from Mexico, who will join us um, through a video message, Caroline Maynard, Information Commissioner of Canada, Gilbert Senduga, who is missing, I hope he will join us in the meantime, and Elona Hojai, Director General, Information and Data Protection Commissioner um, from Albania. Uh, Anjali, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much to the ICIC and to the Albanian Commission for organizing this and for inviting us here and giving me this opportunity. From the Indian perspective, the right to information has been held to be a fundamental right by the Supreme Court of India, which uh, the court has given many judgments over the decades saying that the right to information flows from our constitutional right guaranteed under Article 191A, which is the right to free speech and expression. But the experience on the ground has been very different. And when people tried to access information over the decades after we attained independence, it was virtually impossible for de them to access relevant information, which really led to a demand for a law which would put in place a framework and a process for people to be able to realize this constitutional fundamental right. In India, we've had a very, very strong people's movement for the right to information, which involved not just the formally educated elite, lawyers, journalists, but also people living at the margins, people living in remote villages, people living in the slum settlements at the margins, and everyone came together to demand a strong right to information law. We finally got a national RTI law in the year 2005, and it's one of the most progressive laws because it really involved citizens in the drafting of the law itself, took into account the kinds of problems that citizens had in accessing information. And I would say that what is even more significant is the use of the law after the law was passed. We, I work with Satark Nagrik Sangathan in Delhi, one of the groups that works at the grassroots in the slums in Delhi. And I remember we went into the slum settlements in a meeting, I told people that there's this fantastic law, you must use it. And one of the women stood up and she said, we don't even get our subsidized food cranes. What are we going to do with information? And we realized that people are not interested in information for the sake of information. They want information if it connects with their basic rights and entitlements. So the question was, why aren't you getting your subsidized food grains? And they said that the shopkeepers, the fair price shopkeepers tell us that the government hasn't sent their share of rations to the shops and therefore they could not give it to people. So one of the first set of RTI applications that were filed in India on the right to food was relating to the stock registers, the sale registers and the records of ration shops. When people got this information, it was absolutely clear proof of what was happening. The stock register showed how every month ration was reaching the shops, and the sale register was a clear work of fiction, which had names of people who didn't live there, had names of people who had died long ago, and clearly there was pilferage happening. Using that information, people were able to hold the food department to account. And essentially, amongst various things that happened, the most important thing that happened was that people were able to get their rations after years of denial. And this led to the recognition, which is really something that has driven the right to information law in India, that to be able to access people's basic fundamental rights, the right to information is very, very important. So this linkage has really, is really what has driven the use of the right to information law. 
and we have about 6 million RTI applications filed every year in India by people and especially a majority coming from people living on the margins. People who have understood that without information, their other rights they will not be able to access, they will mean nothing. What we have seen is that the right to information law has been used in India, not just by people to access their basic rights, but also to hold the highest offices to account. So people, because the right to information law in India covers the executive, judiciary, and the legislature, people have asked questions about the assets and liabilities of Supreme Court judges. People have asked for information about the funding of political parties in the country. People have asked for information about uh, cases where they suspect corruption. I can't think of any large corruption scam which has been unearthed in India since 2005 where information has not been accessed using the RTI law. There is really no progressive movement in the country which has not used the RTI law to be able to access information and further their struggles. Whether it's the environment movement, the movement on responsible mining, information has been sought by women's rights movements, uh, by tribal rights movements, and all of these groups have used this information in wherever they are demanding for the furthering of basic rights. The law has empowered citizens in a very, very fundamental way. And here I would like to say that the media played a very, very significant role. Because cases where there were successes of the use of the law, how even the most marginalized persons are using this law have really been uh, uh, carried very strongly in the mainstream media, which has encouraged the use of the law across the country. And in fact, even the public broadcaster in the initial years spent specific programs, had specific programs on creating awareness about the RTI law, which was very useful. Unfortunately, while we have seen that civil society, people, citizens have been at the forefront of demanding a right to information law in India, on using the right to information law in India, they've also had to be at the forefront of protecting this right. Because we are seeing how successive governments have tried to dilute this right, which has been really been an empowering right for people. And at this moment, we are facing a huge backlash in terms of people's use of the right to information law. One of the big problems is attacks on those who use the right to information law. We've had about 100 people who've been killed in India simply for asking information and using it to expose corruption and wrongdoing and human rights violations. We've had thousands of people who've been attacked physically, but even more concerning is the use of draconian laws to launch uh, false cases against those who question and those who dissent and use the right to information law. So we have we are in a situation today where the use of the right to information law is becoming more and more challenging for people, and yet there are people who don't stop asking for information. We have around six million people filing RTI requests. So the governments have also understood that a very important way to dilute this right for citizens is to really cut down on the autonomy and on the, uh, the functioning of the information commissions. Because information commissions in India under the law are supposed to be functioning as friends of citizens. So what we have seen is that in many cases, for example, when political party funding was sought, uh, information about that, the Central Information Commission said that political parties do fall under the ambit of the Indian RTI law. So there has been now an attempt. There were two amendments that were made to the right to information law, both which were very regressive. And one of them basically directly attacked the autonomy and the independence of information commissions. So uh, earlier in the law, 
the information commissions, commissioners, their appointment, their tenure, their salaries, and their post-retirement benefits were determined in the law. But now the central government actually sets the tenure, the salaries, and the post-retirement pensions of all information commissioners across the country. We are also in a situation where information commissioners are simply not appointed. So there are four information commissions at the state level where there is no information commissioner at all. So as a citizen, if people, people living at the margins in tribal areas, if they don't get information, they have nowhere to turn to unless they try to go to the judiciary, which is a very time consuming and expensive process. The government has also brought in schemes and instruments that uh, keep certain things outside the ambit of the RTI law to begin with. So for example, there was an electoral bonds scheme that was brought into India in 2017, which clearly said that nobody can access information on who gets electoral bonds, which political party gets electoral bonds from Anjali, whom. sorry to interrupt. Yes, You'll have I'm to wrapping wrap up. up, yes. Please. So uh, the Supreme Court again had to step when some of us approached the Supreme Court in a petition, there was a very wide kind of uh, civil society uh, opposition to the electoral bonds as well. And the Supreme Court has said that these are unconstitutional because they basically allow for unlimited anonymous funding of political parties. People don't have any information. So I just want to end by saying that uh, we, in India, we have just finished our elections the day before yesterday. Nearly one billion people were voters in the election. And uh, one of the most important and the biggest public campaigns during these elections have been around transparency and the right to information, where people have examined every detail when the Supreme Court asked for electoral bonds to be put in the public domain on who funded which political party. And people have asked for basic information like voter turnout, how many people came out to vote to prevent electoral fraud, people have asked for this information. And I think that as we gather here and we recognize and celebrate the fact that so many countries across the globe are passing right to information laws, and India has a very fantastic right to information law despite the amendments, we do need to collectively think of how we need to protect this very important right, how we need to build on the gains Anjali, that we have I'm so sorry. far accrued, we'll and how we need to prevent democratic backslide. Thank you and Thank apologies. you very much. I would like to invite you now to watch remarks via video from Blanca Lilia Ibarra Cadena, the commissioner from Mexico. Muy buenas tardes. Con la esperanza de encontrarnos presencialmente el día de mañana en las próximas sesiones, es un placer coincidir con las y los especialistas a quienes acompaño en esta mesa de discusión que pondrá de relieve la trascendencia del papel del periodismo en la sociedad civil para fortalecer el acceso a la información, así como para configurar sociedades más transparentes y responsables. La colaboración entre las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, los medios de comunicación y los reguladores de acceso a la información es esencial para garantizar la implementación y el cumplimiento efectivo de las leyes de transparencia. Esta cooperación puede adoptar varias formas y se puede estructurar en diversas estrategias para maximizar su impacto. Por un lado, Las organizaciones de la sociedad civil tienen la capacidad de abogar por los derechos de las y los ciudadanos y monitorear las acciones de las autoridades. A través de su trabajo en la vigilancia y la incidencia, se promueven políticas públicas más participativas, así como ejercicios de rendición de cuentas, por lo que su presencia y trabajo contribuyen a equilibrar el poder entre el Estado y la sociedad. Otro punto importante es que estas organizaciones pueden movilizar a la ciudadanía para que participe activamente 
en el ejercicio de su derecho a la información. Esto gracias a las consultas públicas, foros de discusión y encuestas que sirvan para recolectar las opiniones y preocupaciones de la población sobre el acceso a la información. Por su parte, los órganos garantes pueden utilizar esta retroalimentación para mejorar sus procesos y políticas, garantizando que respondan a las necesidades reales de la sociedad. Además, pueden trabajar de la mano con los reguladores para fomentar la transparencia proactiva por parte de las instituciones públicas. Esto implica que las entidades gubernamentales publiquen información de manera regular y accesible, sin necesidad de que se realicen solicitudes formales y con ello identificar qué tipo de información es más demandada por el público. Desde México hemos buscado generar dinámicas de comunicación bidireccional entre las instituciones y las organizaciones de la sociedad civil que sean capaces de cumplir estos esquemas. Por ejemplo, hemos logrado implementar proyectos como el Programa Nacional de Transparencia y Acceso a la Información, conocido como PROTAI, que es una herramienta de planeación y establecimiento de políticas públicas que busca facilitar alianzas con la sociedad civil. También es importante resaltar el rol crucial que juegan los medios de comunicación en la difusión de información veraz y oportuna, así como en la fiscalización del poder. En primer lugar, los medios tienen la capacidad de recopilar, procesar y difundir información de manera eficiente y amplia. Las y los periodistas, en el ejercicio de su derecho a saber, a través de reportajes, noticias y análisis, convierten datos y documentos gubernamentales complejos en historias comprensibles y también relevantes para la sociedad. Esta traducción de información a un lenguaje accesible y atractivo es esencial para que la sociedad pueda entender las políticas públicas y decisiones gubernamentales que la afectan. Sin esta labor de mediación, los gobiernos pueden permanecer inaccesibles o bien incomprensibles para una parte de la población. Asimismo, los medios de comunicación son vitales para la transparencia y la rendición de cuentas. Con base en el derecho de acceso, se facilita la denuncia de casos de corrupción y la cobertura de temas de interés público. Los medios contribuyen a la formación de una opinión informada en la ciudadanía, ayudan a transparentar los procesos gubernamentales y hacen visibles irregularidades, lo que eventualmente fortalece a las instituciones públicas. De esta forma, se presionan los gobiernos para actuar con mayor responsabilidad, pero también con mayor ética. En este sentido, los medios de comunicación y periodistas no solo reportan sobre los gobiernos, sino que también actúan como guardianes de la democracia, vigilando que las autoridades cumplan con sus obligaciones, manteniendo la integridad del sistema político. Para terminar, no quiero omitir que la colaboración entre las organizaciones de la sociedad civil y los medios de comunicación es crucial para ampliar los esfuerzos de promoción de la transparencia y la rendición de cuentas. Estos actores, cuando trabajan juntos, pueden ejercer una poderosa influencia en la sociedad, fomentando una cultura de participación y fortaleciendo la democracia. El acompañamiento de los medios de comunicación y sociedad civil en este ambiente es algo muy importante, pues amplifica el alcance de la información a lugares donde las instituciones públicas no han podido llegar. Con el proceso descrito, se puede fomentar un círculo virtuoso en el acceso a la información, en donde el órgano garante se encarga de la tutela del derecho a saber. Por su parte, la sociedad civil organizada, con su experiencia y capacidades, puede proporcionar datos y casos de estudio relevantes, mientras que los medios 
pueden utilizar su alcance y plataformas para difundir el mensaje a una audiencia más amplia. Este tipo de ecosistema no solo informa, sino que también fortalece la legitimidad democrática. Para cerrar, quiero subrayar la importancia de la interacción de los esfuerzos conjuntos de la sociedad civil, los medios de comunicación y los órganos garantes del derecho de acceso a la información. Estas tres fuerzas, trabajando en armonía, forman el pilar fundamental de nuestras democracias en el siglo XXI. Las organizaciones de la sociedad civil desempeñan un papel crucial al movilizar a la ciudadanía y abogar por mayores niveles de transparencia. Los medios de comunicación son vitales para investigar y difundir información veraz y oportuna. Los órganos garantes del derecho de acceso a la información tienen la responsabilidad de asegurar que las leyes y políticas de transparencia se implementen de manera efectiva. Juntos no solo vigilamos el ejercicio del poder, sino que también empoderamos a la ciudadanía para que participe activamente en los procesos democráticos, creando un entorno donde la transparencia y la rendición de cuentas no son meros conceptos, sino realidades nítidas. A través de nuestros esfuerzos conjuntos, podemos construir democracias más sólidas, inclusivas y resilientes, donde cada ciudadano tenga la capacidad de incluirse en la vida pública. Sin más, me despido para encontrarnos mañana y continuar con estos debates. Muchas gracias. We're thankful to Commissioner from Mexico for sending her remarks via video. I would like to invite now Caroline Maynard, Commissioner from Canada. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me again this year. Um, we all know and we all believe that civil society and media play a key role in promoting access to information and transparency. And we see that every day in articles in the news. A lot of articles, they say that information, you know, was, um, the, this article was based on information that I, the, the journalist received from an access to information request. The, um, okay, there we go. But I would like to share with you something that happened, something different that happened in Canada last year. Um, journalists were having more and more trouble accessing access uh, information through access to information requests. Uh, our act, just to give you in context, in, our act in Canada is 40 years old. People know they have a right to access and they're using it. And institutions are not keeping up with the demand. The government, clearly not a priority, and I'm sorry when there's an election and there's promises of more transparency, what we see is when these government um, are becoming in power, all of a sudden their tune changes and uh, they're protecting the information that they wanted to have, have access to when they were at the opposition party the year before. So journalists have explored freedom of information challenges in a number of all of our 14 jurisdictions in Canada. And I have welcomed this attention uh, because we have, uh, I as commissioners, we have been uh, raising the challenges and, and, and talking about uh, the, the challenges we're facing and uh, having the media on our side uh, was kind of uh, nice to have last year. Even though often they criticize our own offices, which is fine, um, and I'm welcoming the criticism because I always want to be more efficient. But uh, so, um, just to show you why this happened. Um, in an era of misinformation and disinformation, um, which undermine trust in democratic institutions and harms our most vulnerable population, access to government records is more important than ever for all citizens, including the media. Access to information laws are crucial for democratic engagement. We heard that many times today. They allow media to hold the government and power accountable, 
to provide the public with essential information and shed light on government decision making. And to do this, however, journalists need to have access to information without delay. And this is becoming increasingly difficult in Canada with delays in responding to access requests growing year after year. In 2022-23, members of the media submitted nearly 5,500 access requests to the government institutions at my level, the federal level. This represents more than 14 access requests per day. It may seem like a large number, but it's actually the lowest it's ever been in 10 years. It is only 2% of all requests made uh, in 2022 compared to 11% just 10 years before. Why? Why are media not making more requests? It's not the cost. At the federal level in Canada, it only costs $5 to make an access request. There is no cost associated with processing and treating access requests. Um, it's a lot easier now to do an access request in Canada. It's all online, so that's not the reason either. The main reason is delays. As you know, in a digital world with minute-to-minute -minute deadlines, journalists need the information now. They can't wait 60 days, 90 days, and years to get the information. The information, the, 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 the story is too late at that point. In 2022, less than a third of all access requests were responded within legislative timelines. That's comparable to five years ago where it was the opposite. Only 35% of requests were late. Now we're seeing 75% of them, 65% of them are, are late. And journalists have no interest in reporting on old, out-of-date information because it's not news. So really, access delayed is access denied. So what happened in Canada is, oh, this is going too fast, sorry. Discouraged by the inability to get information they needed, the Globe and Mail journalists embarked on extensive 18-month investigation into what? Access system. It was an interesting uh, twist because instead of uh, reporting on the day-to-day -day news, they were talking about us the system, the delays, why the right is important. And for 18 months, every day, there was an article about access to information in Canada. The Globe and Mail is one of Canada's leading newspaper. It prints and digital formats reach over 6, 000, 6 million readers every week. They not only created or wrote about the access system, but they created an online database that serves as a central repository for completed access to requests from various jurisdictions across the country. So now you can go into that database and search for already responded access requests. They analyze institutions across the country to understand how they handle access requests, including government ministries and municipalities. They even developed a guide to help Canadians file access information requests, navigate the system, and appeal the decisions. Basically, they're doing our government's job. They wrote articles not only to, uh, to uncover significant issues with the ATI system, but also to humanize them. A lot of people know about the rights, but not that many people uses it. And we talked about vulnerable uh, requesters earlier, and I'm starting to think the media is kind of one of them, because if only 2% of them are using access requests. What's going on with our system? But they did talk about like stories about a master degree student who had to go to the UK or to the US to get historical documents to do their uh, master's uh, essay because in Canada, they would have done their three years before they received the information. They talked about individual groups seeking information to get um, reconciliation from uh, uh, indigenous groups. 
they, and not receiving inf any information for years. They gave the stories of immigration applicants being denied their status, not knowing why, and when you ask for an, uh, the answer, it takes months and sometimes you're deported by the time the answer comes in the mail. This is what happened with delayed access to information in Canada. <clears throat> the project showed how the decline of access to information affects journalists' crucial role in informing Canadians. When I meet citizens, I always tell them, if you're not doing access requests to get the information about how your money is spent by the government, what decisions are made, what policies are affecting you, you need to trust somebody that's going to do it for you. Who better? Journalists, the media. But if they don't get the information on time, how is our Canadian getting the information as well? There is a really um, difficult right now uh, movement and, and journalists are saying that the, the investigating journalists uh, may disappear in Canada because accessing information is so difficult and it takes so much time. One aspect of the project was addressing the major flaws in the system. For example, the lack of online publication of already completed access to information re uh, requests for most institutions, which is a concern of my office as well. But again, doing the job that our government should be doing. So the series is called Secret Canada, and, and um, if you go secretcanada.com, you can access the database, their articles. It's a really, really good series. I highly recommend it. They won two awards, a US-based investigating reporters and editors from the uh, Editors Association, and also from the National Newspaper Award for Project of the Year. <clears throat> Again, there have been so many articles about the access, which has helped me bring up a lot of challenges that we are facing as commissioner. We are independent in Canada, but our funding is not. And I'm hearing all the challenges from other countries. This is a way that our political government can play you know, their role of reducing my resources for investigating, uh, not providing resources to institutions to respond on time to access requests. And having the media's attention really helped us uh, raise the issue, raise awareness, and it allows me to talk to parliamentary more often. People are asking me questions because it's in the newspaper every day. So thank, thanks to journalists. I will finish on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Particularly, thank you for sharing this excellent project which personally I'll promote, and hopefully other journalists and civil society will be inspired by this project. I would like to invite uh, Elona to take the floor uh, for your intervention, and then we open the time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. It's a pleasure to be here in this panel. Uh, it's somehow uh, for the Office of the Commissioner, uh, we already shared some of the problems already uh, told by the co previous colleagues. And, uh, but however, in every democratic society, transparency is the foundation upon which trust, accountability, economic progress are built. Uh, the right to information is not just a legal basis, but uh, a provision, but it is a cornerstone of empowering citizens to enable them to hold the governments accountable and to foster inform, uh, informed decision-making processes. As regards Albania, I'm going to repeat once again, just to make that unforgettable moment from Albania, because colleagues as well have repeated it. Uh, we, uh, historically, we have had a centralized governance and the state information was hermetically sealed in the office of our governments. However, this uh, started to change since the end of the communism uh, in 1990s and it was uh, on 
1998, by the adoption of our Constitution, uh, that we have a specific article providing the right to access state-hold information. And according to which, everyone has the right, in accordance with the law, to receive information about the activities of state bodies, as well as the persons exercising state foundations. And this was a very decisive step towards recognizing the right to information as a very fundamental aspect of Albania's evolving democracy. A year after the adoption of our constitution, in 1999, we adopted the first law on access to official documents, and uh, we can say that this law was not sufficiently effective in its implementation. I would mention that because of the relentless efforts of our civil society and our journalists, in 2014, we managed to have one of the best laws in the world, which is the law on, on the right to information. And afterwards, we have also approved our legislation and improved it with Tromsø Convention. Since 2022, we have in place Tromsø Convention in the Republic of Albania. But also, we do have uh, a law on open data as well. As regards the legislation on the right information, this law changed completely the mentality of our public officials. But there is still uh, work to be done in order to change it as it should be. Our law provides for that uh, you, every public authority shall have a transparency program, which is an instrument to provide proactive transparency for the citizens. So there is no need to request categories of very important information. On the other hand, if the information is not provided in this instrument, you have the right to request information by means of a request. Our public uh, authorities have the obligation to respond to the request for information within 10 days. This term is, let's say, a short term for the journalist. And of course, we do understand that the information of the journalist, the, the time for the journalist is crucial. But on the other hand, this is a legal term which our public authorities, in this case, try to remain strict. But yet again, we do have almost 1,000 complaints filed every year because this term is not respected. On the other hand, every public authority shall have a contact point, which is one of the civil servants appointed to make possible coordination uh, to reply as soon as possible to request for information. Obviously, the law provided for that there shall be an independent institution, which is the Commission for Information and Data Protection. But as it was previously said, uh, uh, it is elected from our parliament. However, financially, it is not that independent as it should be. We face the same challenges as an authority towards uh, the problems that the journalists and our civil society organization face in receiving information. They need the request to be processed in due time. However, our public authorities do find manners to delay the information, to not respond in time, to restrict the information, and sometimes this restriction is not based on grounds provided as the law uh, states specifically. However, we can say that uh, we have a good legislation, but the implementation, we have to do a lot of work towards uh, proper implementation of it. We can say that uh, journalists and the civil society activists in Albania, of course, have faced a lot of obstacles in their quest for the truth. Uh, in fact, we understand that our public officials somehow fear the journalists and fear the civil society. Uh, but 
If their activity is in accordance with the law, there is no reason to fear of the journalists or to fear of any request for information coming from the civil society. On the other hand, our, uh, we, not just our public officials, uh, we have to understand that uh, someday we will not be a civil uh, servant anymore, but we will be a, a, a citizen out there and we wouldn't like and uh, to get this kind of refusal to any request for information. And in that regard, we think that it is necessary to increase focus on training our civil servants to strengthen especially their technical capacities to guarantee application of the right to information. But on the other hand as well, we shall say that it is necessary to continue efforts to promote the participation and empowerment of right holders, uh, which are the citizens and the journalists in, uh, in this case. We have, of course, specific cases when the public officials have restricted information, which afterwards, after request of the journalists, have made causes, very important uh, uh, cases, uh, like different contracts, uh, confidentiality. It's one kind of ground that it is used uh, frequently, but in fact, it has resulted that it's not very grounded on the, on the law. But this is... Uh, matter of culture, we think that it cannot be done overnight. It, is, it shall take it time. For Albania, we have only 10 years of applying the law. We, we are not justifying uh, not applic proper application of the law, but we think that both the parties shall take the necessary time in order to uh, know their rights better and the obligation betters, better. Uh, I would say that the Office of the Commissioner reaffirms that uh, through our unwavering commitment and loyalty, we can overcome the obstacles and build a future where the right information is not fringeable and where journalists and civil society organizations are free to fulfill their vital role as protector of democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elona. Um, I would like to open the floor for comments and questions from the audience. Please limit your interventions to one minute, one minute and a half. I see a gentleman there and then uh, the lady here, first there. Thank you to the panel members for your presentation and the insights. So just know, I'll go straight to the question. I mean, this is my curiosity. Um, in most of the cases, what you know, we have seen is the media and civil society, uh, particularly the case of uh, you know, my country, Nepal, where I come from, um, they work in silos. One of the reasons is there is a deep mistrust between um, media and the civil society. So is there any kind of best practices or any, any suggestions from the panel members to uh, bridge this you know, disconnect so that media and civil society come together and be the part of that bigger ecosystem to support particularly the vulnerable communities and also you know, uh, support uh, the vulnerable communities for the uh, access to information. If there is any, any insight, any best practices, or any suggestions, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's a very good question. So Anjali will, will take that, but we'll take more questions uh, in the meantime. The lady here. Um, I gave the floor to her and then she's the third one. Thank you so much for the presentations you have delivered. I'm uh, Shabnam Gambarva uh, from the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights, Ombudsman of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And my question, uh, I have two questions, one for Ms. Anjali and one for Ms. Caroline. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what kind of um, the level of cooperation of SNC with the kind of police bodies or uh, law enforcement bodies and what if it's on a good level, what kind of any remind um, remarkable case on your mind 
of the positive result of your cooperation with police bodies with regard to obtaining of information. And to Ms. Caroline, what uh, kind of activity you carry out with regard to the information, um, uh, open information access um, re requests lost uh, due to technical results, to technical um, causes, for example, any kind of collapse of IT system and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Third question. Uh, I think it's the lady there, if you can pass the microphone. Thank you very much for the very insightful uh, round of panelists. I have two questions. Uh, my first is um, on the role of civil society. Often it's you know on creating awareness, supporting access, research, monitoring, and attempting to hold the state accountable. I'm wondering if any of the panelists could actually share uh, good practices or good models where the role of civil society is actually um, institutionalized uh, throughout the drafting process, drafting of the right to information legislation as well as other policies and in supporting the actual implementation. I think it'd be very interesting for countries like mine. Um, I'm from Malaysia where we are still in the process of drafting and it's critical to have uh, the voices of different people reflected. So that's my first one. My second question I think is to do, um, the moderator mentioned slept. I think we all know that you know, within the right to information framework, often there are other competing legislations, uh, particularly on secrecy and security, that often can undermine right to information and access to information. In this regard, um, are there any good practices or models you can share where uh, attempts to uh, harmonize these legislative uh, framework and to create a more conducive environment for media, civil society, and public in, in general to be able to access information. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman there, and then we have here. Thank, thank you very much, panel. Um, David Hamilton, I'm the Scottish Information Commissioner. Um, just a very quick question, and that was, um, given the media response, particularly in Canada, and the frustration there um, that they had, did, did that have an effect in itself in terms of galvanizing public opinion to get behind this, or did politicians just ignore that as well? Thank you very much. Sorry, my first um, comment, one is a comment. I'm Teresa from the Malawi Human Rights Commission. Um, the first one, I, I just wanted to agree with uh, the panelists that I think um, we really need to do more, especially for the information commissioners in terms of setting a precedence where you're breaking um, uh, the spirit of silence or secrecy. Um, there is an example in Malawi where recently we had a request from journalists where they asked the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, uh, to provide a list of who is in the foreign missions and uh, what their qualifications are, particularly because there's a lot of secrecy around how are these people appointed. And uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs said no, they couldn't grant that request simply because it was a threat to national security and, um, and uh, also because the, the issue of personal data of uh, these people. So I just wanted to encourage, and the Malawi Human Rights Commission's decision was that no, these reasons don't make sense, and therefore ordered the Minister of Foreign Affairs to provide this information. And therefore I'm saying this to just encourage um, information commissioners that we really need to protect uh, this right, the access to information right, by critically looking at the reasons why um, state institutions are refusing to provide information. And in this case, you can see that it was really baseless. Um, uh, my question is to Canada. So in Malawi, we also have a challenge in terms of encouraging journalists to use the access to information law, uh, particularly because of the delay in provision of that information. Um, legally, there's 15, a 15 day period, but of course it can go months because of some delays, bureaucracy and so, so forth. And I just wanted to understand what strategies have you put in place, if any, to encourage journalists to actually continue to request for this information 
um, so that maybe we can borrow a leaf um, in our case as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I hope you have taken notes of all the questions. And I would like to ask you, the three of you, to try and answer as many questions as possible and also provide your concluding remarks in three minutes or four. <laughs> okay, four. Let's make it four. I am under pressure, so I'll, I, I need to, to be on time. So in four minutes, I would, uh, yeah, I'd be thankful if you conclude your, your answers and concluding remarks. Okay, I don't remember all the questions, but with respect to, I'm really good at parliamentary committees when you ask questions like this. You know. Technical issues, we just had a huge problems right now with the uh, Canadian uh, boarding agency in Canada lost two years of all their access requests. Around uh, 20,000 access requests were erased from their database. The server was transferred to another server, no backup. We lost everything. Unfortunately, within my authority, I cannot investigate uh, the reason behind all this. I may have some complaints, but there is no uh, authority under the, uh, the Access to Information Act with respect to documents that don't exist, only with respect to requests where there's a document or when there's a record. So we may have a big challenge there when we, we talked about technical issues. The only thing that is different is if we think there's a criminal intent if the, the data was erased and we see that there's maybe intention or malicious, you know, why it was, then I can refer that to the police and ask them to uh, investigate. Um, actually, I can only refer to the attorney general who will then decide whether they want to pursue. Um, with respect to journalists encouraging them and the media attention that we had in Canada, uh, it has had a huge impact in terms of questions for parliament, questions from other media uh, journalists, questions from the citizen, institutions uh, being also questioned about delays, and uh, which so far has not been, um, in terms of actions taken by the government, hasn't shown any uh, real actions, but I think it, we're getting there. I think they're really tired of being criticized. They're really starting to uh, uh, see that people are paying attention uh, but at the same time, we keep, we have to keep going. We have to continue to, to, to challenge. And the one thing about delays, I find the management of information within institutions is one of the worst in Canada, I don't know, and other countries, but uh, what used to be a couple of pages in a folder is now millions of emails, millions of uh, digital uh, documents. And that's one of the reasons it's taking so long to respond to access requests. So what I tell to journalists is make sure you talk to the institution and you tell them exactly what you want. Don't do a big, vague, broad request. Talk to them, negotiate, and once you get two pages, ask for more. Don't ask for a million pages. You're not gonna get the information in time. So that would be my, my uh, suggestion in terms of focusing, s scoping the request. Uh, thank you very much, Anjali. Maybe you also address the question of mistrust between civil society and institutions. Sure. So several questions, I'll just try and address uh, some of them. The one on the media, uh, it is true that the media has to play and has been, wherever there is a strong use of the right to information law, a very strong partner. And uh, in India, for example, we saw how the mainstream media, including the public broadcaster, played a very important role in creating awareness about the right to information law. And in the initial years, I think it really played a seminal role in ensuring that more and more people knew about the law, understood the law, and used it, because they saw how it was being used very successfully by people everywhere, including the marginalized. Uh, unfortunately, and I think it's important to state that in this panel, what we are also seeing, for example, in India, and I, I'm not saying that that's true in all countries, is that there is a, an increasing level of inequality. So if you are go to go by global inequality indices, uh, one of the reports has said that only nine families own about 50% of India's wealth. And those are the nine families that are today owning most of the mo mainstream channels. And which is why we are seeing that in the mainstream, there's not enough uh, stress, 
which is being placed on people's concerns, especially those of the marginalized, and on issues that empower them, including the right to information, there I think the social media has played a very, very important role. So we've seen that in the past uh, decade, the social media has been used very effectively to carry stories uh, about the successful use, and more and more civil society groups, citizens, have found a voice in the social media channels uh, where uh, they have been able to tell their stories, and the social media has carried it. Um, in terms of um, you know, the question that you posed of the police uh, and, you know, whether um, there has been the right to information and what the experience has been also. Uh, in India, the courts have ruled that all first information reports that are filed to the police are made proactively available. So uh, if anyone files a complaint, the FIR, the first information report, has to be put online. It has to be made publicly accessible. And I think that certain depart departments which are public facing, there needs to be more and more move towards putting information in the public domain rather than leaving citizens to go and try and access by filing uh, an information request. Um, finally, the question uh, I wanted to just touch upon was the drafting of the law and the involvement of civil society and even subsequently. Uh, in India, like I mentioned, because there was a strong people's campaign and movement around the right to information, people were actively involved in drafting of the law. Uh, it did take into consideration the challenges that people faced. But more importantly, we've seen that where there have been spaces, for example, the Department of Personnel and Training has had several task forces which have included uh, many of us uh, from the civil society. It has been very, very powerful because we need to remember that uh, as we talk about proactive disclosures, which is something uh, that after the law was passed, there's been a focus on, it is important to remember the ground realities. In India, uh, our uh, re various uh, reports show that only 33% women in the country have ever used the internet. This includes uh, even people, women, who are one-time users of the internet. So, uh, like we saw from Bangladesh, uh, it's very important to have proactive disclosures in the most disaggregated form and at the ground level in the most easy to understand ways. So, through wall writings, through um, pamphlets, there has to be information that is disseminated, not just on the internet. Of course, the internet is the first place, but also physically. Thank you. Thank you very very much. I would like to invite Elona for your concluding remarks. No? Okay. So, uh, as regards the question comment coming from our colleague from uh, Malaysia uh, regarding involvement of civil society and NGOs in drafting legislation, uh, I would bring a live example, Ms. Kosari here. Uh, last year in Albania, we proposed some amendments to the law on the right information. In our view, there were improvement of the right information, but there were also included a provision regarding abusive requests. Uh, in fact, it was to address th those requesters who file a huge number of requests of our public authorities. But uh, this was, uh, let's say, uh, objected strongly by the civil society and our uh, journalist led by Ms. Kosari as well, and it ended up that this provision was finally uh, not included in the, the new amendment of the law on the right information. So this request was against uh, the, the principle or the, the spirit of the law on the right information, and the civil society managed to uh, get involved directly in this new improvement and listened. Thank you very much for mentioning the example. Um, just some concluding remarks before I let you go for lunch. Um, on the drafting process, I wanted to say that the earlier you include civil society, the High, the, the possibility that you have better legislation is, is much higher. Uh, the opposite, and this is an example in Southeast Europe, but also in some EU member countries, 
you have situations when politicians draft pieces of, legisla of legislation, then it comes into public, and there is a lot of discussion, opposition, etc., and that results in bad piece of legislation and waste of time. Or you have examples when civil society is including from the very beginning, and in the end, not necessarily all the comments from civil society are taken into account, but as long as it is a frank discussion, then you have a, a piece of legislation which is even uh, a, a praised by civil society. So the earlier you engage them in the drafting process, the better. On slaps, slaps are legal actions used against journalists, public watchdogs, civil society. And I mentioned in this conference uh, slaps on purpose because what is happening now is when journalists and civil society publish information on matters of public interest, then you have claims coming from politicians, businessmen, powerful lawyers, which are unfounded, but they are, they are abusive and they are done with the, with the uh, uh, aim to, to, to censor journalists, to remove that information from, from the public. So what happens is these claims are filed before data protection uh, agencies, before your agencies. And it is very important that this, this new trend that is happening within, at least within Europe, is taken into account uh, within the work that, that you do. And I want to use this opportunity very briefly to go through some concluding remarks. We don't have the time to digest everything now, but hopefully we'll take what, what uh, panelists said with, with us and use that in, in the future. Personally, I'm very inspired by Secret Canada, as I said, but I want to make my, my own comments. Um, and I want to say that with regard to the role of commissioners in relation to civil society, um, there should be some some preconditions which need to be fulfilled in order for this collaboration and cooperation to, to work. And the first one has to do with political will. Transparency and accountability of public authorities is a matter of political will. One country can have beautiful legislation, excellent manuals, promotional videos, but if there is no will to um, uh, be accountable to the public, the public will hardly access information. In such a situation, it becomes very difficult for commissioners and agencies because instead of serving as an institution that should rule in exceptional cases, in fact, they become the primary address of civil society and journalists. No agency or commissioner has the capacity to serve as a complaint body for every single denial of freedom of information request. Second, the second remark has to do with independence, professionalism, and commitment of commissioners. Commissioners and agencies to facilitate access to information, they need to, again, fulfill three preconditions, I believe. It is key to have commissioners who are independent from political parties, especially from ruling parties. They should serve to the public, not to politicians or other interest groups. Commissioners might, must be equipped with sufficient resources, especially well-trained staff members who believe in transparency and have up-to-date knowledge of standards. And thirdly, commissioners who are committed to working with civil society and media, even when they are criticized by them. The doors of commissioners and agencies should always be open to everyone. Finally, it's about slaps. Please make the fight against slaps also part of your work. Do not allow your institutions to be abused by rich and powerful politicians and businessmen to censor media and activists. A good start would be to know how to identify slaps, and uh, we at ECPMF would be very happy to help you. Thank you for your attention. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much to the moderator for keeping a tight grip on time. And it's time for lunch, ladies and gentlemen. A couple of uh, logistical notes for everybody as uh, you can actually sit down and uh, get your stuff. Um, lunch is uh, served the floor below, so second floor. Um, it's going to start now, one hour. I would kindly ask the moderators of um, the parallel sessions after lunch to keep their times tight, because then it will be necessary for all of us to come back, have a coffee break, and then continue on this plenary hall. Two parallel sessions, one takes place here after lunch and the other one is on standard room floor number one. That's it. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Hello. Um, 
thank you for choosing this session, which will be really, really relevant for the discussions in this event. Uh, so this is, as you know, proactive transparency through digital tools and open data initiatives. My name is Maria Baron, and I will be the moderator of this session. I am from Argentina, and I head an organization called Directorio Legislativo that has a global and a more, of course, regional agenda in Latin America, but global initiatives as well on open government and open parliament. And we're also chair of uh, the board of the Open Government uh, Partnership. So without further ado, today we will discuss some of the, uh, and bring ideas and experience from our uh, speakers on the benefits and, and some of the challenges while using uh, tools on digital and open data initiatives. And as well, there will be a lot of discussion, I hope, on proactive um, ideas on uh, uh, digital tools and, and uh, open data. So without uh, furthering uh, my uh, and, and robbing minutes, I'll give the floor to Adrián Alcalá Méndez, who you have heard this morning, and who is the chair of the uh, INAI in Mexico. And uh, he's a lawyer. He uh, has a master's degree in Amparo, and he's also a PhD in law. So, Adrián, the floor is yours. Gracias. Ah, yeah, you can go. <laughs> ¿Es esta? Sí, ¿verdad? Perdón. Muy buenas tardes tengan todas y todos ustedes. Gracias por estar aquí en esta sesión alterna, eh, en, este, en, en esta mesa de, de discusión sobre, precisamente sobre la transparencia proactiva y los datos abiertos como iniciativa o herramientas precisamente para fortalecer los datos abiertos. Sé que después de la hora de la comida es una hora difícil para hablar, pero les agradecemos precisamente el tiempo. Saludo en novio del mismo a mis compañeras y mi compañero panelista, así como a la moderadora. Y es un gusto pues compartir con ustedes este panel en donde profundizaremos en cómo los gobiernos pueden aprovechar las tecnologías de la información y los datos abiertos para transformar eh, la transparencia proactiva. Los datos abiertos y la transparencia son elementos esenciales e indispensables para fomentar la rendición de cuentas y la confianza de las instituciones gubernamentales o la confianza que la sociedad tiene en las mismas. En primer lugar, los datos abiertos permiten que la ciudadanía acceda a información pública que es relevante en la gestión lo que facilita el monitoreo y a la vez la evaluación de las políticas y lo que está haciendo el gobierno o de las acciones eh, gubernamentales. En este sentido, también eh, otro beneficio clave es la mejora en la eficiencia y en la efectividad de los servicios públicos. Los datos abiertos permiten, desde nuestra perspectiva, identificar las áreas de mejora y optimización en la gestión pública. Por ejemplo, los análisis de grandes bases de datos permiten también eh, revelar patrones y tendencia que antes de que existieran leyes de transparencia o el acceso a la información no se conocían. Y hoy, gracias a los datos abiertos que son el núcleo esencial de la información, permite adelantarnos y precisamente determinar o develar esos patrones para efecto, por ejemplo, en las contrataciones públicas, prever actos de corrupción o desvío de poder. Además, los datos abiertos fomentan la innovación, ya que desarrolladoras y emprendedores pueden utilizar estos, más bien estos datos para crear aplicaciones y soluciones tecnológicas que aborden problemas sociales y económicos. Así es que se impulsa la transparencia proactiva con un instrumento capaz pues, de apoyar los esfuerzos y lograr una gobernanza mucho más abierta. El desafío importante para implementar políticas de datos abiertos es la falta de infraestructura tecnológica adecuada, lo cual conlleva a un obstáculo para desarrollar políticas de transparencia proactiva adecuadas. Por ejemplo, aquí en Albania me da muchísimo gusto ver, ¿verdad?, ayer en Tirana cuando llegamos, que los propios taxis traen Wi-Fi. En mi país 
Los taxis no traen Wi-Fi. ¿Eso qué permite? Son ejemplos en donde hablamos de brechas de desigualdad. Y para hablar precisamente de la publicación, reutilización de datos abiertos, hay que invertir en tecnología y sobre todo en comunidades como México, donde tiene muchas comunidades rurales, en donde no hay acceso a nuevas tecnologías de, 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 tecnologías de información. Para implementar efectivamente estas prácticas de apertura, los gobiernos necesitan contar obviamente con sistemas y plataformas tecnológicas que permitan precisamente la recopilación, almacenamiento y distribución de los datos de una manera segura y eficiente. Esto, por supuesto, que requiere inversiones eh, tecnológicas y capacitación obviamente de personal. La transparencia proactiva se nutre, por supuesto, de eh, calidad y la interoperabilidad precisamente de los datos. Otra de las características de los datos es que estos sean interoperables. Para desarrollar una política apropiada en ellos, es importante que sean precisos, actualizados o que estén presentados en formatos que permitan su fácil acceso y su fácil eh, reutilización. Para superar estos obstáculos, es fundamental que los gobiernos adopten un enfoque estratégico y colaborativo en materia de transparencia proactiva. En México, eh, contamos con una conferencia nacional de datos abiertos, le hemos llamado la Datacon. Este es un espacio que desarrollamos desde el INAI eh, para dialogar, para colaborar entre personas e instituciones de los diferentes sectores, el sector agro, agro, este, agropecuario, el sector automotriz, el sector de las tecnologías, para hablar precisamente a nivel nacional, para ver cómo podemos usar y utilizar los datos. Es un diálogo horizontal, no es un diálogo vertical, en donde fuimos a las diferentes regiones del país de México y recogimos todas las experiencias de todos los sectores. Por supuesto, la academia es importante, la sociedad civil. De una manera colaborativa, esta conferencia ha buscado desde su creación en 2021 generar un punto de encuentro para que se debatan las prioridades que debemos de impulsar, por ejemplo, en el sector automotriz, ahora que tenemos este, precisamente un nuevo eh, tratado de libre comercio que en Estados Unidos y, Norte y Canadá, cómo lo reinventamos, el New Shoring, cómo lo hacemos, cuáles son las prioridades, no solamente desde el punto de vista gubernamental, sino también del sector beneficiado o en su caso perjudicado. Eso es cuando hablamos precisamente de un diálogo horizontal. En México y alrededor del mundo tenemos diferentes grupos que nos ayudan a comprender la importancia de construir una cultura de los datos eh, abiertos. Algunos ejemplos de cómo utilizamos los datos abiertos fue precisamente durante la pandemia COVID-19, que se desarrollaron plataformas para identificar eh, camas de hospital, hospitales eh, que estaban con camas disponibles, pero también durante los huracanes que han devastado a México, por ejemplo, huracán Patricia en 2015, o los terremotos de México en el 2017, y también el huracán recientemente que azotó y que destruyó eh, gran parte de Acapulco en el año, de, el año pasado, el huracán Otis. Para que las iniciativas de datos abiertos sean sostenibles y sigan evolucionando para satisfacer las necesidades cambiares de la sociedad, los gobiernos deben de aprovechar e implementar varias estrategias claves. Primero, establecer marcos legales y normativos que institucionalicen los datos abiertos. No solamente basta con políticas, sino que es necesario contar en la legislación con esta institucionalización de la política de datos abiertos, pero también la eh, ¿Más qué? Ah, perdón. Ah, ok, perdón. Es que estaba viendo el reloj, perdón. Eh, es necesario contar con, eh, con legislación que, que adopte estos mecanismos de la publicación de datos abiertos. Las leyes y las regulaciones deben definir claramente las obligaciones que tienen los diferentes sectores gubernamentales y cuáles serán también los mecanismos de vigilancia para que las propias autoridades publiquen información en datos abiertos. Otra estrategia clave es fomentar la participación activa de la sociedad en este ecosistema. Podemos contar con legislaciones, podemos contar con obligaciones, con sanciones o con mecanismos de vigilancia. Pero si no contamos con una participación activa de la sociedad que conozca primero qué son los datos abiertos, cuáles pueden ser los beneficios de utilizar datos abiertos, esta política difícilmente va a lograr su cometido. Ahorita en la comida platicábamos que estos problemas 
de la falta de respuesta, de la falta de soluciones, data de hace más de 15 años. Entonces creo que tenemos que ver en los datos abiertos y en la transparencia proactiva una nueva frontera para solucionar las problemáticas que aquejan en nuestros países. Para ir concluyendo, en el año 2022 el INAI lanzó una cruzada, una de las más ambiciosas que ha emitido el INAI, que le denominamos Abramos México. Esa estrategia, Abramos México, incluye un, un conjunto de políticas y acciones que están dirigidas precisamente al desarrollo de prácticas de transparencia proactiva, como la nueva frontera de la transparencia o la transparencia por diseño y también la utilización de datos abiertos. Los ejemplos que les platiqué hace unos momentos del huracán Otis, de cómo utilizamos la información de datos abiertos para tratar de combatir o no combatir, sino hacer frente a la pandemia COVID-19 o los sismos y terremotos del año 2017 en México, dan muestra del potencial transformador que tienen precisamente la utilización de los datos abiertos. Finalmente, para concluir, en estos tiempos en donde estamos totalmente interconectados y en donde utilizamos prácticamente todo el mundo es digital, es importante eh, la utilización de datos abiertos. Tenemos la capacidad de promover transparencia como en ningún otro tiempo en la historia moderna de este mundo. Por ello, creo y estoy convincente, convencido de que es nuestro deber utilizar tanto al núcleo de la información, que son los datos abiertos, como a la transparencia proactiva para mejorar el entorno de nuestras respectivas sociedades. Muchísimas gracias y una disculpa por lo rápido que hablé. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I would like to highlight some of the interesting initiatives that you mentioned. Uh, for example, the collaborative work that you do uh, in the interior of the country, uh, the idea of building a culture of uh, open data, uh, also the, the well-known uh, efforts that you have done with data around the pandemic around uh, the earthquakes in 2017 and also on the hurricane in 2015 and how that really, really benefits people all over uh, Mexico because it, it's a rapid response mechanism that you have built really, really well known, especially around the region. And also the idea of uh, how important it is that society participates in the whole process uh, to go uh, sort of narrowing down and caliber more the benefits that uh, all these mechanisms and efforts have, especially, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the program or the, the, um, the yes, the, the project, uh, Let's Open Mexico or Abramos Mexico with uh, practices around uh, active transparency and open data. So with that, thanks a lot again, and we will, uh, change a little bit the order because we have here our colleague Skokol Bardi who has just arrived and has to leave earlier because he has a meeting in the ministry and we want to, to hear his um, reflections. Uh, Sokol is the Director General at the Ministry of the Economy, Culture and Innovation. So we have, uh, we're lucky to have him, so here the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for, for inviting us. And I hope you so far had a good time in Albania. And thank you again for choosing Albania for this occasion. I wish you had, uh, I wish the rest of the time will be as fruitful and this uh, organization will deliver the right messages and bring the right focus to the topic of, the, of this occasion. On behalf of the Ministry of Economy, Culture and Innovation, which unfortunately the minister and his deputy couldn't attend by himself, I, I had the privilege to, to be here today on their behalf and speak on, on the name of ministry and his minister, Gonzia. And we'd like to highlight that uh, we consider it to be very important 
the organization of this discussion table and conferences, which addresses the challenging in the digital age related to the open data of public sector bodies and public entities. Uh, I would like to mention that the Albanian government is committed to working for a better, qualitative, open and transparent governance. The amount of public data in our country, including their tribes, has grown significantly in the last years. When such data are open for use, they serve not only to increase transparency, good governance, administrative accountability, scientific research, but also to develop the economy through innovative solutions. Well, I know that innovation is lately a fancy word. It's, it's the new smart, but we'd like to use it and uh, most of all to address it and use it to deliver value to society and mostly the, the use of data and the open data. Open data supports and encourage, uh, encourages innovation and ensures greater accountability for improving democracy. That's for sure. That I'm, uh, you, I believe you all agree on that. In Albania, we can mention good public administrative practices of open data cases, which are implemented today by several institutions, like Institution of Statistics and State Authority for Geospatial Information, as well as the portal opendata.gov.al, which was created by the National Agency for Information Society, which preceded the, the requirement framework and with his initiative created this portal. Given that this regulatory situation did not guarantee at first the sustainability of having public data in the public domain and their use through appropriate technical means as well as with the aims of promoting digital innovation, the data economy and research, especially regarding artificial intelligence, the Albanian government approved the law on 2022 on open data and reuse of public sector information which complies basically with the directive of the European Union 2019-1024. For the first time, this law entered in force in April 2023. Uh, the need for intervention in addition to the above law arose from the fact that the, exi the existing legal framework lacked the full regulation of open data and their reuse. Among other things, completing the legal framework in the regards of was also an obligation for our country to join the integration in the European Union. The adoption of this law will contribute to strengthening the data economy of the country by increasing the positive effect of the reuse of public sector data on the economy and society. Increasing the amount of public sector data available for use ensures competition, fair and easy access to markets based and public sector information and strengthen innovation, growing businesses, modernizing public services, and empowering citizens. The law defines the rule and procedure for the reuse of documents held by public sector bodies and public enterprises, the implementation of which adds value to the benefit of the users and users and society in general, and in many cases to the benefit of the public body itself by allowing the later to improve the quality of the collected information and the performance of a task from the feedback of information users. Some of the main objectives we aim to achieve by embracing this in initiative are, is the rapid development of innovative business models through increasing the number of active business operations in the ICT area, adapting the technological changes in the field of management and the use of data by gradually impl implementing all, uh, most, in most of the sector the API system for receiving data in real time, including the beginning of the application in the field of transport, reducing or removing legal, technical or financial restrictions that promote the flow of information for economic operators and the public and putting it at the service of public interest the implementation of EU standards for open data and reuse of the information. Citizens will see significant improvements in access to information, social inclusion and civic participation. 
there will be an increase in public data for citizens, which will provide better information service for them, such as real-time public transport data, geospatial data and GIS maps, transparency data for good governance by effectively reconceptualizing the relationship between the government and the citizen. Access to open government data can bring numerous benefits to individuals in which open access to information democratizes knowledge, allowing individuals from all background to access valuable resources regardless of their socioeconomic status or geographic location. This fosters a more inclusive society where everyone has the opportunity to learn and grow. Access to information fuels civic engagement by enabling individuals to participate in democratic process, whether it's through the accessing government data, participating in public forums, or engaging with the media sources, informed citizens are better equipped to contribute meaningfully to society. Open data promotes transparency and accountability within government authorities, and that's for sure. Citizens can scrutinize government action and expeditions holding the official accountable for their decision and performance. The list goes on, but uh, I'm sure everyone is aware of the benefits of the open data. So. The overall ensuring transparency and inclusivity through access to the information empower, empowers individuals to participate fully in this society, make informed decisions and contribute to positive changes. It's essential for building a more equitable, accountable and interconnected world. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish... Uh, Again, I would like to mention that I wish this uh, activity delivers the right messages and touches the right topics. Thank you again. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very, very much for uh, highlighting the benefits of uh, open data initiatives and digital tools in, in the Albanian government, as well as uh, describing the uh, democratic process, let's say, that Albania has put in place to uh, incorporate an institutional framework around uh, openness and transparency, especially in, in, in uh, open data, and also um, how it has been to uh, and, uh, include uh, civil society and the collaborative process that you have uh, put in place so that some of these tools, not all of them, uh, are uh, um, uh, in, in place today in Albania and some of them, I hope, in the future will be passed uh, and, and implemented well as well. Um, now we'll give the floor to our colleague Bruno Lasser uh, from France. He's the head of the Commission for Access uh, of Official Documents. Mr. Lasser was uh, president of the Competition Authority from, uh, in France from 2004 to 2006. And before that, uh, or in, in 2000, Sorry, in 2016, he was appointed president of the interior section of the Council of State uh, in France as well. So, Bruno, let's give the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, and good afternoon to um, all of you. First of all, thank you for inviting me in the, in the panel, and thank you for ISIC to uh, accept our membership application. Surprisingly, we are a very old institution. CADA has been established in France in 78, so we'll be uh, 50 in, uh, in a few years of time. But surprisingly, we were not members of the organization. We discovered that through a visit of our Philippines colleagues coming from Manila, and we, uh, we, we, we decided to join and very happy to be members of the organization, and uh, I'm very happy to, to be here with you. Um, in my remarks, I, I will do them in, in English in order to ease the, the job of our translator, who are excellent, but uh, uh, I think it will be uh, more direct uh, to, 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 to do them in English. Uh, I would like to describe the 
two steps um, of transparency we experience in France, um, and maybe the, the lessons we can draw from that uh, experience, and maybe the challenges which are ahead of us. The first step is what I call transparency on request, and that historically, the first step of our duty as um, specialists of uh, transparency, public transparency. There is a document, um, a, a citizen, a journalist, somebody is interested by the document and makes a request to access that information. And if the information is denied, he has to go to a, through a bureaucratic process to challenge the decision which has been made. Um, in France, this step uh, has been organized uh, in 78 through a, a bill which, uh, surprisingly, in the French history, has something very peculiar. In France, uh, the law of, on information uh, access, public information, the FOEI, uh, the French way of FOIA, was the result not of a government uh, initiative, but from a parliament initiative, that the members of the parliament, coming from different parties, political parties, who get along to impose the government, this very ambitious and wide-ranging legislation, the government of the time didn't want. So that explains why the bill is very generous in the, in the wording of, of, the, uh, of the legislation. Uh, the, the rule is transparency, the secret is the exception, and interestingly, it is the, 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 the person, the individual who makes the request, who chooses the way information is provided. It can consult, of course, it can have a paper copy, it can have an online uh, copy, but, and it is up to him to decide, he can force the administration to, um, to publish publicly on internet the um, information, and that's not the administration which chooses, that's the person who asks, uh, who decides. Um, well, this step number one is very important, but today in France we deal each year with uh, between 10,000 and 11,000 complaints about access to information, that's very much. And we have to deliver every opinion, individual opinion, in the time frame of one month. So it's very challenging for us, and culturally, it creates some frustration, because when an administration faces a request for information, I say not, not every time, but sometime, the civil servant sees the people request as an enemy. Why this information is asked? Why this request is made? Is it to challenge a future decision? Is it to damage my reputation? Is it to criticize what I am doing? So it creates antagonism between administration and people. That's why um, um, we need to cross a second step, which I call proactive transparency where um, uh, the administration doesn't react to a request, but organizes spontaneously uh, transparency. And in France, it has been the second step of our legislation, which has been decided in, um, in, in, in um, well, seven years um, ago, uh, by a legislation, very comprehensive legislation dating back from 19, um, sorry, 20, uh, 2016, 2016. And this is legislation called uh, Legislation for Digital Republic organizes this um, proactive transparency by doing roughly three things. The first one is that provides access to algorithm and source codes. Um, and um, we presume that every algorithm, every source code is publicly available. Uh, it's available uh, for the person who, has, uh, who, 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 who has, is the object of an individual decision based on an algorithm or a source code, but it's also available for any person 
which is interested by accessing um, algorithm and um, source code. So we presume that every algorithm and source code used in the public administration, state or local, is public. The only limitation is some protected secrets, for example, the security of the system or intellectual property rights. And we have examples where we have to strike a balance between the need to uh, provide availability and the need to protect secrets. I mentioned, for example, uh, algorithms which are used to detect fraud, uh, the tax administration, the customs administration, or even administrations who serve benefits from families. Uh, they, they, to target controls, they define, of course, high profile of fraud people. And of course, if you know the algorithm, you can escape controls and you can encourage fraud. So we try to make, on a case-by-case -case assessment, a right balance between access and uh, protection. The second initiative is about um, open data, um, dating from back from um, the, the law I mentioned, um, 2016. Uh, the law makes compulsory open data policy for every state body or every local body, provided it has more than 50 employees or uh, 3,500 inhabitants for local, um, local institutions. And that's very broad. Um, every, um, every information which has been made available by an individual request, any database which is received or maintained by the administration, any um, database um, comprised in what I call in public inventory, and any database which has a social, economic, or environmental uh, utility um, interest is supposed to be, um, to be uh, made compulsory. And that's uh, very um, important. The last initiative, and I mentioned the three the free ways of this um, proactive transparency, is the liberalization of the reuse of uh, public data. Uh, it means that there can't be any restriction on the way this public data can be used. It's free of charge, and I remember very well when the law was debated, there was a parliamentary debate about the need to pay for the information or not, and the parliament decided that, well, public data was a part of public patrimony, and that could be made free of charge. So uh, the law states that the reuse is, um, of course, possible, it's not subject to any license or fee, except very limited uh, exceptions, except very limited restrictions. And what is very important, and I echo what has been said in my, my, by, by the previous panelists, uh, it's of public interest, because in many domains, in many fields, I mentioned, for example, transportation, environment, health, the fact that there is open data, that there are huge data which are available, has fostered innovation. Uh, the launch of startups which, uses, sees, which use this data to promote and to create new services available to the public. I make my end, uh, ending remarks by saying that now we are in the step three, <laughs> trying to manage transparency on request and open proactive transparency and it's not easy, because uh, transparency is a never-ending process. The more you publish, the more you generate uh, requests for supplementary um, information. And we believed that at the end, we couldn't be necessary, that there would be no need for an institution like us to exist. And the, pr the fact is that uh, we, we exist, and we have more and more administrative challenges to, to, to do. That's life. Uh, well, that's very challenging, and that's the reason why we are still here and happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like, again, to highlight some of the things that you said, uh, starting with the use of FOIA requests by MPs, which is something uh, that still happens in many, many countries today. Um, of the three... Uh, steps and uh, accesses that you mentioned, uh, 
the access to algorithms and uh, 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 and uh, the public availability of that data is really, I think, a good example of what we're looking for. Um, then the public inventory, let's say, of the open data uh, bases, databases that you have is also a good one. Uh, and then the third one on the reuse of information um, on uh, sort of the, the no restriction on this data, on the on the capability of other startups to use that data to start their own innovation and uh, sort of the idea that this is a never-ending story uh, of requests because what uh, when you uh, publish or make, avail make available a, a piece of information then that leads to another request and another request. So thank you very, very much. And we'll now uh, uh, give the floor to Mike Kemp. Make is the Berlin Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information uh, since 2022. Before that, from 19, uh, 2019 to 22, she was Legal Officer uh, for Justice, Home Affairs, and Sports for the representative of the Free uh, City of Bremen uh, to the federal government. Uh, and uh, Make is going to talk to us about the main challenges and some of the barriers that the governments face in implementing uh, open data initiatives. And then she, she will try to, to enlighten us on, um, sorry, on uh, uh, proactive transparency. And then I think uh, an interesting point about data protection and the role of data privacy and security in the context of data initiatives, and uh, yeah, so the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues from authorities, dear colleagues from civil society and uh, uh, other attendees, and dear fellow panelists. Um, I would like to thank the, the uh, organizers for the kind reception and the opportunity to share some uh, points on proactive, pro proactive transparency and open data initiatives and the role of privacy and data security in those initiatives. In Germany, the legislative landscape for proactive transparency obligations and for open data initiatives um, is very complex. As you may know, Germany is a federal state consisting of 16 states and the federation. Uh, to date, 14 federal states and the federation have enacted uh, freedom of information law, but uh, only four states um, have already developed these laws into transparency laws or implemented transparency laws from the start. What does that mean and what does the transparency laws differ uh, from Freedom of Information Acts? We already heard this from, from the French colleague. They contain proactive transparency obligations rather than obligations to provide, provide information upon request. That also includes uh, the obligation to put up transparency platforms and registers and to, to pre present the information there proactively and, um, of course, make them searchable. The benefits are apparent, I think. We heard today a lot about uh, delayed answers um, to information requests that are then useless for journalists, for instance, or the threat that people have to reveal who they are and what they are interested in, um, and, and that this can get really dangerous for them. Both of those problems, of course, could be tackled a little bit, I have to say, with uh, proactive transparency platforms. So there are efforts in several federal states in Germany and the Federation to expand laws or existing laws to include proactive transparency obligations and to create uh, the basis for information to be made available on those transpar transparency platforms. In the federal state of Berlin, this reform of the Berlin Freedom of Information Act, which actually dates back to 1999, and it has not been uh, amended since then. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really, really old uh, freedom of information law. 
And um, for years there have been demands from our authority and strong demands from so, uh, civil society initiatives to, to finally amend the law or um, develop it into a transparency act. Finally, this demand has found its ways into the coalition agreement under the current government in Berlin. Hence, there are reasons to be optimistic, about, but we are not there yet. <laughs> and in contrary to what we have seen in draft laws before, where there have been many, many exemptions uh, from the proactive transparency measures, uh, where, where whole departments were just kept out of the laws, for instance, Department of Education, all those information that is very relevant to Berlin people, um, there is now, in, under the current government, at least a political commitment in the coalition agreement um, and to also reduce any kind of exemptions and only exclude intelligence activities. But, as I said, we, I want to see the draft and then we are talking. Uh, in contrast, uh, open data initiatives in Germany have uh, de developed rather independently for, of debates on the reform of freedom of information laws in recent years. Uh, in Berlin, uh, the first open data strategy was adopted by the Berlin Parliament in 2011, and it was uh, revised now in, in the last year, 2023, after an extensive participation process involving actors from business, science, administration, and civil society. This revi revision led to a shift in the uh, strategy that is now focusing not only on the interest of private sectors, economy, but also on the benefits of the data for public administration. So according to this new strategy, the possibility of publishing data should be considered from the beginning of its existence. So it's an open by default policy as part of the digitization process of the Berlin administration. However, promoting the publication of data from the beginning of ex its existence does not only concern open data initiatives, but also initiatives to support freedom of information or proactive transparency in, get in general. Hence, in my opinion, we must attach the de development of the laws of freedom of information into transparency laws to the more intensive efforts from governments that I see that are made for open data initiatives. It's kind of to support the perhaps somewhat less popular sister, uh, this approach would not only focus on the economy and administration as the main benef beneficiaries as we see, but also on the individuals and their participa participation rights because they are the beneficiaries of Transparency Act. In my opinion also the possibilities that arise as part of administration administrative digitalization are not yet being used sufficiently. This is uh, due to work units in public administration responsible for digitalization often lacking the knowledge and the awareness to ensure compliance with uh, transparency oblig obligations right from the start. In order to close this gap and provide assistance for public administrations, the German Commissioners for Freedom of Information are working on recommendations for organizational and technical measures in order to facilitate compliance with those transparency obligation in public administration. One particular focus was on specific measures to promote freedom of information in connection with the introduction of electronic file systems. For example, organizational measures to implement freedom of information, information by design concern the inclusion of all ways of communication used by public officials and administrative files. This also includes communication via messenger service, SMS, social media, and short messages services. Um, because we have seen some cases in Germany where uh, that have proven that it is necessary to make relevant SMS communication from government representatives available for the public. 
Um, examples for technical measures to promote freedom of information are tools that enable a comprehensive search of the information held by a public body. And in addition, tools um, including AI tools that help to identify information to be redacted or facilitate the implementation of redaction can be used. Besides those very important organizational and technical measures, uh, let me add a, a personal comment. In my opinion, we still need a change of culture in our administration, and I think this is also something the French colleague pointed to. The mindset of public service employees has to become more service oriented in uh, Germany, and it has to shift to a more supportive administration. This also includes to understand that the promotion of transparency of administration action and documentation is a public interest in itself, and which also leads to more prioritizing these issues, that it is an official public task. It is key that this idea is implemented in the work culture of administration. I can say for Berlin that this is not always the case. For instance, what, which could be a step to motivate people to go there is when administrative staff benefit from open data or proactive transparency measures themselves when they get uh, information, as you would say in Germany, auf dem kurzen Dienstweg, what, which would mean something like uh, on the short way um, if you don't have to request another administration body to get information, but just go to a transparency platform and really quick uh, um, get your information or answers that you need. So we as authorities for freedom of information should also be role models in this regard. Finally, one point that should also be considered, you already mentioned it, uh, with regard to open data and proactive transparency initiatives is data privacy and security. As I'm also the Commissioner for Data Protection in Berlin, I would also stress the point of anonymization of data uh, sets, especially in the open data context. And um, at the moment, we are working at the European Data Protection Board on guidelines how to anonymize data, and we very much hope to uh, operationalize these guidelines for handleable uh, guidelines for also the open data community. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving us uh, your reflections, especially the ones uh, looking ahead, uh, as recommendations and, or what other uh, uh, ca what can be done in other contexts as well. I would like to highlight the um, uh, uh, the idea of expanding transparency laws that include proactive uh, obligations. Uh, then uh, th wish you luck on the uh, Berlin, uh, and uh, you seemed optimistic on one side and not so optimistic on the other side. Uh, and when you mentioned that the whole, there's whole departments that are uh, bringing recommendations on the exceptions. Um, and then uh, on the open data uh, regarding uh, the, the main beneficiaries today, the private sector and the public administration and the idea that these uh, regulations should be more service oriented. Um, and uh, the interesting work that this commission that you mentioned is doing regarding electronic files and how to uh, give uh, our public information on uh, SMS and text and WhatsApp or, or, or the like. Um, and also finally, the idea uh, of transitioning from a specific FOIA uh, regulation into a more, uh, uh, you call it transparency, more overall uh, concept of open data, uh, uh, proactive transparency, uh, FOIA in itself, less regulation and more uh, service oriented. So thank you very much. And now we have, finally, uh, we have Mary Whelan, uh, who is um, a policy analyst within the Innovative Digital and Open Governance uh, Division 
of the OECD. Her work is within the public, <coughs> sorry, the public governance directorate that focuses on uh, how governments can better inform, engage, and empower citizens, civil society organizations, and other stakeholders. And that's why she's going to address us uh, today on how can uh, civil society organizations leverage open data to promote transparency and advocate for social change. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction, Maria, and thank you very much to our hosts for inviting me to be here uh, among our esteemed panelists. Um, my name is Marie Whelan, as mentioned, and I'm here representing the OECD, so I thought today that I would share some insights uh, with all of you from some OECD surveys and studies that we've undertaken uh, in the area of access to information and open data, uh, give you a little bit of an overview of where we're seeing progress being made, where we're seeing challenges for many countries, and mention as well some of the ways that we're trying to support countries in moving towards more proactive disclosure, uh, more targeted transparency, and using digital tools and, and other means as well. So firstly, as a contextual slide, why is a commitment to proactive transparency so important today? So it's maybe not a surprise to many of you that many countries around the globe are facing crises of low trust in national government. Um, as part of the OECD Reinforcing Democracy Initiative, we've been looking very closely at the issue of trust over recent years. And while we don't have uh, yet a wide range of data on the correlation specifically between transparency and trust, I did think that one data point was quite important to highlight. So the 2021 version of the OECD Trust Survey found that only four in 10 citizens currently say that they trust their national government. Uh, something that we thought was interesting to point out is that among citizens who say that information about administrative services is easily available, 50.8% trust the national government, compared to those who say they can't find information easily about administrative services, only 22.1% of those people uh, in that category said that they trusted the government. Now, at the same time, there is always the caveat that the benefits of more transparency are not always immediate. They can first expose controversies, scandals, corruption, uh, that can have adverse effects on people's perceptions of the government in short and medium term. So with that as the backdrop, I wanted to take you through the OECD approach to access to information and open data and some of the trends that we're seeing from OECD members uh, and non-members alike. So access to information, as we've already heard today from many people, and we see it the same way, it's a fundamental human right. It empowers citizens to exercise their other rights, so freedom of expression, assembly, association. It's actually the first step in the OECD ladder of participation, so we see information as a necessary prerequisite to having any meaningful participation, any meaningful engagement with the government. Um, we've been looking quite closely at legal policy and institutional frameworks for access to information in recent years, and we've seen that in general, at least in OECD countries, they are quite strong. But what has been mentioned today as well earlier by uh, in other panels is that there's a real challenge in implementation for many countries. And so countries are really now looking for both themselves, ways to develop tools to measure implementation, their own implementation, and also impact. And they're also looking to other actors, for example, UNESCO, on how they can really uh, monitor progress in this, in this area. Um, on open data, I wanted to mention that countries are increasingly adopting an open by default approach. In fact, all OECD countries have, um, but some are actually going further. They're now including formal requirements in strategies, in laws and regulations, specifically on open data. And so while this is obviously a, a triumph, um, we've actually seen that only a few OECD countries, uh, I'll name some names, uh, Canada, Norway and Italy, um, Actually, they're, they're the, among the only countries that consider implementation of open data requirements in key performance indicators of public sector organizations. Um, at the same time, more and more countries are making uh, high quality data sets available. They're encouraging use, reuse, of, as we've heard, uh, free distribution. They're also establishing open data portals and other digital tools to disseminate uh, information and data to the public, which is great. Um, I also wanted to highlight uh, a measurement tool or a ranking tool more so um, at the OECD, the Our Data Index, which has three pillars. So it looks at data availability, data accessibility, and government support for reuse. 
and actually the best performing uh, countries in the 2023 edition um, were Korea, Poland, and one of our panelists, France. So it seems all the hard work is paying off. Um, I'd also like to mention that most of, and, and actually it's, it's what our panelists from France uh, already highlighted, that a lot of these top ranking uh, countries, they have an open data strategy, they have legal requirements for uh, publishing high quality data, and they also engage with stakeholders, both within and outside of government to really promote data, to data reuse. Um, at the same time, there are still some challenges remaining. So, for example, only 48% of high-value data sets are available as open data across OECD countries, so more can be done in this area. Um, and also, similarly to access to information, there's really a need to make further efforts on monitoring the impact of open data on public sector performance and then also on the economy and on society at, at large. So really asking the question of how you can quantify the impact of open data. Now, I won't go into a lot of detail here because I think it's maybe obvious to many of you, um, but I wanted to highlight some important considerations, some important findings in terms of proactive disclosure and targeted transparency. Um, so maybe you can see on this graph here, we asked countries what they most commonly proactively disclose uh, as per their laws. So you can see some of the most, co um, most commonly disclosed um, types of information here, things like organograms, salaries, functions of public institutions, etc. cetera. Um, in addition to access to information laws, we've also found that lots of countries have secondary guidelines to really guide public officials on proactive disclosure. Um, they usually highlight that information needs to be up to date, timely, accurate, uh, easy to understand, easy to use and reuse. Uh, some of them also mention if, if information is requested multiple times, then you should start to proactively disclose it. So it's, it's one more type of request that you don't need to respond to. Um, also, we're, we've seen in some more advanced uh, guidelines that targeted transparency is the overall aim. So quality over quantity, what information do stakeholders actually want and how do they use it uh, to kind of avoid this, this data overload. Um, I'll lastly mention the benefits, but I'm sure they're obvious to many of you, uh, but things we've heard from countries on, on why they think proactive disclosure is important. It helps them to inform citizens, communicate national strategies, programs, and projects to the public. It builds buy-in with reforms. It can help to counter misinformation and disinformation. It can facilitate cross-learning and collaboration between public bodies, and can also, if you're looking for a business case, let's say, uh, it can attract foreign direct investment and encourage international cooperation as well. So many of these have already been mentioned. Uh, countries, of course, have been making great progress um, and often in innovative ways that really leverage the digital transformation and use new digital tools. At the same time, many of them are facing similar challenges, actually, OECD and non-OECD alike. Uh, they can be internal, meaning barriers within the public administration, uh, lack of leadership and political will, limited human financial resources, uh, insufficient training, capacity building, weak information and archives management, uh, lack of infrastructure, and a lack of monitoring and evaluation. Um, and then also we've mentioned some external uh, issues. So for example, maybe citizens are not aware of the fact that they have the right to access information. Maybe they're not aware of all of the data sets that are, that are available for them to use. Um, we've also mentioned something that has come up before, a, a low trust between actors, between citizens, between civil society, between media, um, which can really affect their desire to engage with the government at all, um, and also crisis context, so COVID-19 and, and digital divides as well. And it's not mentioned here, but something that has come up in the course of the discussions, um, this idea that it, there's really a need for a cultural shift. It's not going to happen overnight. There's a need to move away from a secrecy mindset, let's say, um, towards more openness and realizing that it's beneficial for, for all parties. And lastly, um, I know there is an entire session on this, so I'm going to be brief, but uh, I think it's important to highlight again how crucial accessibility and inclusivity are in any discussion around transparency, access to information, open data, especially when we're talking about them in, a, in the digital era. Um, and so something that we kind of highlight as criteria to consider, let's say, um, 
is the use of plain and simple language. So countries like Finland, the United States, the United Kingdom um, have guidance on using plain language to interact with citizens. Uh, also communicating in official and minority languages to the extent that you can. So for example, Colombia does a lot of work on um, also using indigenous languages. Um, then testing the usability and of digital tools and platforms to ensure that all citizens can actually locate and understand information. So for example, accessibility in, in web design. Um, then holding consultations and focus groups with users for feedback. So people with disabilities, youth, women, as we heard about earlier, elderly, people with low digital skills, etc. cetera. Um, and I know Mexico does a lot of work in, in this regard as well. Uh, and then lastly, really taking a, a multi-channel approach to sharing information and data so that you're really reaching all, all groups in society. And I just had a last graph um, there on something quite specific, but we asked countries, um, do they have support for people making requests if they have special needs? Um, and as you see, only about half of them do, so it's an area where more attention is still needed. Um, so with that, I will close, but looking forward to the rest of the discussion and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much. Just a couple of comments from your presentation. Really, really interesting. Those three countries, I missed uh, the third, Canada, Italy, and Japan, or on uh, <laughs> indicators uh, on open data uh, when they are evaluating the implementation with in, in other programs. Uh, then also on proactive um, disclosure, uh, the chart that you mentioned, that you showed uh, really low on the things that we need to know. For example, the, um, the minutes of meetings and agendas of ministers, that's the, the lowest. Uh, and then uh, a couple of, of concepts that you shared, the quality, the quantity over quant quality, the quality over quantity, sorry, um, and the chart on the challenges on the internal, the external, and also the context. It's really interesting how you put it. Um, and uh, two more things, the need that, some, that many people shared it before, the need for a cultural shift and how to do that. I think that's a big, que big question we all have. And um, the uh, initiatives about or on inclusivity, plain language and all those. There are some countries that are advancing in that and, and we should uh, keep a uh, closer eye on what they're doing. Um, with that, uh, I'll ask you to uh, share questions with, good. <laughs> so we'll do the following. So the woman with the light uh, blue uh, shirt, the woman behind you, and then you, and after that you, and then you. So five, six. Six questions, please, brief, brief questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Bruno Lazare uh, from France. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, source codes and algorithms used by uh, uh, public sector in public sector should be accessible to, to people, to public. Uh, only exceptions are based on security and intellectual property. And my question is, what are you doing? Well, actually, what would you do in uh, some concrete case? In Serbia, we have uh, one case, uh, an NGO asked the Ministry of Social Affairs uh, for source code uh, for program uh, for social aid. And that NGO claims that uh, Ministry designed that program uh, in order to discriminate uh, Roma people who very often a lot of children. On the other hand, uh, the Ministry claimed uh, that this source code or and the algorithm couldn't be published because for security reasons and also uh, because that would be breach of uh, personal data. And uh, we have a really huge conflict between those interests. And what would you do in similar cases? Thank you. So the woman behind you, she had a question. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, to thank the panel for the um, rich uh, contributions. Um, I'm glad that we are, we are moving from access to information to access to data. And my question is, um, what about data held by big tech? Because really that is where the, the world is moving. How, how, how are we doing in terms of making them big tech to make data available for the public good, uh, for research purposes, for economic development, because this is really where data is being held. And uh, our laws, which really are restricted to access to public, uh, publicly held data, are these laws still fit for, for purpose? Because it looks like the real data is being held by big tech, and what are we doing about this as the ICIC? Thank you. <laughs> yes, and then bef after that, you with the glasses and the uh, suit. Yeah. Thank you to the panelists. Um, freedom of information laws are a transfer of power from the executive to the public, and that's how we've understood them as the right to make requests to get information. But in many cases, the laws where they specify proactive disclosure leave it up to the government to decide what information is going to be proactively disclosed. Does the laws in Mexico, Germany, and France provide for citizens to make requests for certain data sets to be published, and if so, can they complain to the commissioners if the government refuses to publish those data sets? Thank you. One more, and we'll, yes. Here? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question for OECD. Um, you mentioned that, uh, I want to say once again, uh, one of the elements that make information not accessible is the fact that public servants are not uh, trained. Are there any good examples within OECD where they have integrated uh, access to information laws and its implementation into public government schools or any other um, training programs of uh, government services? Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we answer these four questions? And why don't we start with Bruno, who you have one specific and then one or two generals, or three. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, we had a, a case um, mentioned by our first um, um, attendee. Uh, that was the case where the uh, body, which in fact uh, delivers benefits from, for families, uh, has been suspected to target controls on poorest families, saying, well, there are social bias in the way you control uh, families because it is effectively the families who have the most uh, children who live in certain territories which are targeted. So we had to strike a balance saying, well, what kind of criteria are used to target controls and are they exempt of social discrimination? And in the same way, we had to prevent um, the use of algorithm to escape targets because we consider that, of course, uh, among the secrets which are be to be protected, the secret of prevention and search of offenses. So uh, we decided that um, the, 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 the criteria in their final form, which were used at the time where the request was made, were not uh, available, but just the, the, the shape of the algorithm in the previous uh, year. Uh, I mean, if there is any slight change in the criteria, it wouldn't be uh, accessible, but the former shape of the criteria would be in order to check by anybody that there is no, in principle, social discrimination. Do you see? We try to, 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 to weigh on, I would say, the, the interest in presence and to make that kind of balance in order 
not to say no to um, the right to access, but in the same way to protect um, uh, the, 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 the fight against fraud and uh, only, not only individual fraud, but we know that there exists high profile fraud. Um. Yes, so we have two more minutes, two for everything. So, yeah, 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 yeah. My, my boss here is, <coughs> if n it's not me, then I'm the bad uh, woman. <laughs> I'll be extremely fast because only one example comes to mind in any case. Um, but yes, so on the topic of training for uh, public officials on access to information, I don't know so many of those who integrated into the into public administration schools, um, but I can tell you about one recent example that uh, we've been following quite closely. We've been working with Romania recently, and the General Secretariat of the government um, are doing really great work in this regard. So they, they're basically in charge of trainings for access to information. So they have regular meetings with the focal points in different public bodies. They ask them if they have any roadblocks, if there are any bottlenecks in the work that they're doing. Um, they also are there to guide and give them advice if they maybe get a request and they're not sure if it's subject to a an exception for national security, data protection, et cetera. Um, and they're also working with them quite closely. It's a bit of a, a broader project, but uh, there's an op uh, open government strategy that's now in, in progress. And they're working really closely with access to information, all of the different focal points, um, to really see that it reflects the, the reality on the ground. But I will look into some others, because I know we have them, and uh, get back to you. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. So we have two more minutes. Remember two minutes ago, we still had two more minutes. And so we have the question from the woman around the big tech, and we have the question around uh, the proactive transparency uh, prerogatives, and uh, we have the OECD one. One line for each, and then everyone can approach the rest, uh, the, the panelists after, yes? Okay, maybe I start. Um, the European uh, Union has made approaches with the Data Governance Act and the Data Act for a more a competitional approach to open data uh, to, um, that is produced through technical devices to be used for innovation, but the focus is not on the individual right to access this data. And for you, um, just for the German laws, at, in the existing transparency laws, there is no uh, um, possibility to request that a data set is a made, as has to be made transparent, but the laws also include still the individual requests possibility to get the juicy stuff. And um, of course, uh, it should also be implemented that once somebody has requested information and it is given to that person that this information is supposed to be made transparent, proactive, transparent afterwards. Gracias. Creo que lo que entendí de la un, de unas preguntas qué es lo que pasa cuando el ciudadano no le satisfacen su petición de información o que la información está en la plataforma, de acuerdo con las leyes, en México existen dos mecanismos. Uno es que acudan ante nosotros como INAI, somos un tribunal administrativo, y la otra es vigilar a través de una denuncia anónima para que le obliguemos al ente público a que publique la información. So, thank you, thank you very much. Approach the panelists if you still have questions after this Sorry, sorry, but they're doing like this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm, a, a, I'm a, in the middle of the right to information. Sorry, sorry so much. Thank you very much, and I think there's a coffee uh, minute.